Well, 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 look who's interested in sport touring. After thousands of dank nooners and wide open highway poles, my baby squids have earned enough XP to level up into sport touring dads. How's your back feel? Is it sore yet? Don't worry, it'll happen. The vertebrae gremlins come for us all sooner or later. If it's not being tucked away into the pocket of a sport bike, it's from the hours of frenetic discord scrolling that has your spine starting to resemble the Fibonacci sequence. But never fear, motorcycle companies are determined to retain your business no matter how relentlessly gravity pulls down on your mortal being. Thus, I present to you the sport turning motorcycle. They're kind of fast, pretty comfortable, and have enough storage space to hold dozens of emotional support beanie babies. What is the difference between an adventure bike and a sport touring bike? What bikes created the sport touring archetype? And most importantly, what are some of the best sport touring motorcycles available today? We're going to cover all of this and more on today's episode of Sport Touring Dude, Shaft Drive Lube, Yami Noob. Sit back, relax, grab some popcorn, maybe a tea, maybe a coffee, whatever your predilections may be, and let's get into it. The term sport touring has been used to describe motorcycles for several decades, but its popularity in the motorcycle industry began to increase in the 1980s and 1990s. During this time, there was a growing demand for motorcycles that offered a balance of sporty performance and long distance touring capabilities. Manufacturers started to develop motorcycles that were designed specifically for this purpose, and the term sport touring became became more widely used to describe these bikes. As the popularity of sport touring motorcycles grew, so did the recognition of the sport touring category as a distinct type of motorcycle. Today, the term sport touring is commonly used to describe motorcycles that offer a combination of sporty handling and touring capabilities, and is recognized as an important category within the motorcycle industry, mainly because people still buy them and those guys spend a lot of money on them. During this time, sport touring bikes vaguely emulated a sport bike. They usually had a full fairing and large displacement engines that were capable of sustaining long durations of highway speeds with ease. But unlike a traditional sport bikes, the clip-on handlebars were raised to a more accessible position that didn't force the rider down into the pocket. A super committed position with your hands low and your feet far behind you is best suited running quick laps on a racetrack or rev bombing the Chick-fil-A drive through on your Jigsaw 600. So the sport touring motorcycle offered a compromise. You still had plenty of power on tap. Those sport touring motorcycles usually have their engines detuned for more accessible power and torque. As I'm not sure how many people would otherwise want to rev out their FJR to redline just to get the 650 pound bike up to speed on city streets. In addition to more amenable ergonomics and different engine tunings, sport touring motorcycles typically come equipped with luggage as well. Having storage options is key for a sport touring bike as the average long distance motorcyclist doesn't want to have to play Sophie's Choice to determine whether or not they have the room to accommodate a toolkit or a waifu body pillow. One of the first sport touring motorcycles was the Yamaha FJ1100. This bike was introduced in 1984 and it quickly gained a reputation for its combination of speed and comfort. The bike was updated in 1986 with a larger 1200cc engine and it remained in production until 1993. The FJ1100 and subsequent FJ1200 were making around 130 horsepower. It had wind protection and agreeable ergonomics and was designed to strike a balance between performance and utility. The FJ bikes from Yamaha definitely set a standard for sport touring motorcycles from the big four. It was so significant you can still find the FJR 1300 on showroom floors today, even if they're, you know, a little long in the tooth. Okay, look, I truly don't even need a clever segue for the sponsor today. You're watching this video because you're interested in getting a sport touring bike. If you ride a sport touring motorcycle or spend any sustained amount of time on your motorcycle, you need a rock form phone mount. You buy a knockoff phone mount off Amazon, you're going to spend the entirety of the group ride walking up and down the highway playing cell phone scavenger hunt. So don't cheap out. Having a rock form phone case and phone mount is one of the best investments you can make. You can easily and securely mount your phone for use for directions or control your music or connect it to the proprietary app that all sport touring bikes are coming with nowadays. Like I said, there is no need for a clever hook today. If you're riding a sport touring bike or you want a sport touring bike, you need a rock form case and handlebar mount. It's really that simple. And if you use the code YN25, you'll receive 25% off your order. Go to rockform.com or click the link down below and use the code YN25 at checkout for 25% off.
Thanks, Rock Form. Now back to the video. Another really important motorcycle to help establish the sport touring framework is the BMW K100 RS. Before the flying brick was the preferred platform for cafe racer build, affluent dentists and Bavarian pretzel makers alike praised this motorcycle for its balance of performance and rideability. The flying brick, named for its flat four engine that sat longitudinally in the frame to prevent power loss to the drive shaft, had many other innovations as well. It was an early foray into liquid cooling for BMW, who had been known for their air-cooled and oil-cooled motorcycle engines. But in order to compete with the big four, specifically the Honda Goldwing, BMW you had to pull out all the stops. The K100 was fuel injected, which had only just barely made its way into motorcycles a few years prior. Using a Bosch fuel injection system pulled from the 3 Series cars, the K100 made more power, had a smoother power band, and was more fuel efficient. The K100 was definitely an important stepping stone for the sport touring archetype. This style of sport touring motorcycle ultimately made way for bikes like the Kawasaki Concourse and the Honda VFR Interceptor. And this sport bias style is drastically different than what you might think of as an outright touring motorcycle. Big, beefy touring bikes, also known as baggers, are a whole different animal than the sport tour. While both sport touring motorcycles and baggers are designed for long distance riding, there are some key differences between the two types of bikes. Remember, a sport touring motorcycle is typically designed with a focus on sporty handling and performance while also still providing a pretty comfortable riding position for long distance touring. Sort of like if you look at a sport touring bike from 30 feet away and squint your eyes, you should vaguely see the silhouette of a sport bike. These bikes are more lightweight and nimble than baggers and have performance features like adjustable suspension, advanced braking, and high powered engines. Bagger motorcycles or touring bikes on the other hand are typically designed with a focus on comfort and convenience for long distance touring. If you were to squint your eyes and look at a bagger in the distance, you wouldn't see a sport bike silhouette. Instead, you would likely see the beginning stages of a midlife crisis. They often have larger fairings and windshields for greater wind protection, as well as saddlebags or other storage options for carrying luggage. Bagger motorcycles may also have features like heated seats and grips, sound systems for dad rock and GPS navigation. While some bagger bikes have decently powerful engines and may be capable of going pretty fast, I mean, I've seen turbocharged 131 kit Harley Davidsons on YouTube and man, that thing will boogie. Baggers are typically super heavy, like 850 pounds and far less agile than sport touring bikes. They're better suited for long distance cruising on highways and going in a long straight road or being parked in front of a biker bar every Thursday from 5 p.m. until midnight when shots of Canada Club and lap dances from Haggard Hillary are both half off. Sport touring motorcycles are far more versatile and can handle a wider range of riding conditions. And now adventure bikes or ADV bikes have also become super popular. Many sport touring motorcycles today adopt much of the styling and functionality of an adventure bike, but are designed for sport riding on paved roads instead of off-road adventure riding. While both sport touring motorcycles and adventure bikes are designed for long distance riding, there are some key differences between the two types of bikes. A sport touring motorcycle is typically designed with a focus on sporty handling and performance, while still providing a comfortable riding position for long distance touring. Sport touring motorcycles are usually designed to be ridden on paved roads and optimized for handling on smooth winding roads. Now, adventure bikes, on the other hand, are designed for riders who want to explore both on-road and off-road terrain. They typically have an even more upright riding position, long travel suspension, and they're taller as well too, and allows them to handle rougher terrain and off-road conditions. Adventure bikes often have larger fuel tanks for extended range, skid plates to protect the undercarriage, and hand guards to protect the riders from branches and rocks. Adventure bikes are often features for off-road riding, such as selectable ride modes, traction control, and ABS that can be turned off for getting squirrely in the dirt. While some adventure bikes may have a powerful engine may be capable of fast sporty riding on paved roads, they're generally heavier and less agile than sport touring bikes. But this gets complicated because there are some motorcycles that come in what are essentially ADV trims or sport touring trims. For example, Triumph makes the Tiger 1200 Rally and the Tiger 1200 GT, the Rally trim being more of what you would expect from an adventure bike. The Rally variant is built with off-road capabilities in mind. It features a more rugged design, long travel suspension, and semi knobby tires to handle off-road riding or trips to the coffee shop. The Rally variant includes various pieces of ADV accoutrement like spoked wheels, engine protection bars, skid plates, and handguards. The GT variant is designed for more on-road touring and long-distance comfort. It emphasizes comfort, luxury, and features that enhance the touring experience. The GT model is equipped with a suspension tuned for on-road comfort, offering a 
smooth ride on the highways and paved roads. It prioritizes stability and comfort for long distance touring. The GT variant focuses on touring amenities such as the electronically adjustable windscreen, heated grips, panniers, electronic rider aids, and a more refined and luxurious overall package. But it's interesting because in today's world, people typically use adventure motorcycles for touring duty anyways. They'll take these bikes that are wildly capable off-road and they spend 95% of their time on road and just slabbing it up on the highway just to make it to a gravel road and camp out at a campsite. In my opinion, most people are better served with a sport touring bike for long distance riding than an adventure bike. Unless you're really gonna be doing 60-40 or 50-50 split for on-road, off-road, I really just think you should get it at sport touring bike. It makes a lot more sense. It's important to make this distinction because in pursuit of making the most optimal do-it-all motorcycle, many manufacturers make motorcycles that blur the line between sport touring bikes and adventure bikes. For example, if we look at sport touring bikes from Kawasaki, they have both the Ninja 1000 SX as well as the Versus 1000. The Ninja 1000 SX is a sport touring motorcycle designed in the style of the original sport tourers. It's a sport bike at heart with modifications made to be better suited for comfortable long distance riding. Whereas the Versus 1000 is a touring motorcycle at its core, with tons of creature comforts designed to make this bike capable of riding hundreds of miles at a time with ease. But there are still many aspects of it that make it sporty as well. At the end of the day, its 1000cc engine still makes 120 horsepower and 75 foot-pounds of torque, not to mention its electronically controlled suspension and quick shifter. But the Ninja 1000 SX has a more aggressive riding position with forward-leaning posture that's better suited for riding that falls on the sporty end of the sport touring spectrum. You see what's happening here, the motorcycle market has pretty much just like laser focused all these little niches just so they can convince you that you need to buy more motorcycles, which I'm not arguing with. Now the Versus 1000 has a more upright riding position which is more comfortable for long distance touring. The Ninja has suspension that's stiffer and more responsive making it better suited for aggressive riding in twisty roads. And the Versus 1000 has a more plush suspension that's better suited for absorbing bumps and providing a smoother ride over long distances. The Versus is also going to be equipped with better wind protection and more options for luggage. Is the 1000SX leaps and bounds more suited for longer distance riding compared to the ZX10? Definitely. But is it going to be lacking in many of the amenities that the bike like the Versus has? The 1000SX is perfect for the aging fast boy who just can't stomach the nerd core styling of the Versus, but whose lower back can't handle another season on a true replica race bike. Now, Yamaha has two sport tourers in their current lineup that are very different motorcycles. They have the FGR 1300, which is a successor to the OG FG 1100 and 1200 from the 80s and 90s. The FGR is what many riders think of as the quintessential sport touring motorcycle. It's got the big 1300cc four-cylinder engine, round, bulbous, aerodynamic bodywork, and a big old 6.6 gallon gas tank. But Yamaha also has the Tracer 9 GT, a sport touring bike distilled down from the MT-09. The FJR 1300 has a larger and more powerful engine than the Tracer 9 with a peak output of 141 horsepower compared to the Tracer 9's 119 horsepower. This extra displacement and power plus the extra weight could potentially make the FJR more comfortable to sustained high speed cruising. But the Tracer 9 is far more lightweight which will make it a lot more playful in corners. Both both bikes come with electronically adjustable suspension, wind protection, and luggage. It's mostly a matter of whether you want a big, planted, heavy sport touring bike or a smaller, more playful bike. Guys, time is running out to win this Aprilia 210 660 factory. May 19th at midnight is the very last day you have to get entered to win this thing. Head over to yamanoob.co and you will get three X entries for every dollar you spend on orders over 100 bucks to win this Aprilia 210 660 factory. Don't miss it, time is running out. Now, if you're an aging fast boy of a European predilection, here's a referral code for an online therapist. Just kidding, of course. Ducati and BMW are no strangers to sport touring segments either. BMW has the R1250 RT. This motorcycle is much of what you'd expect to find on a sport touring motorcycle from a brand who prides themselves on Bavarian luxury. The R1250 RT has a 1254cc boxer engine that makes 136 horsepower and 105 foot-pounds of torque. It has a 10.5 inch TFT dash. Sounds like these BMW riders are trying to compensate for something as well. That's an enormous screen. As well as dynamic cruise control and options for things like heated seats and tire 
higher pressure monitoring. The R1250RT is definitely aiming for the luxury touring end of sport touring spectrum, but still has a bit dialed back from their K1600 bikes, which compete more closely with those big baggers like a Goldwing or Harley Davidson. And lastly, of course, is Ducati, and they have the Multistrada. The Multistrada comes in many flavors depending on your Ducatista dedication and the amount of biscottis you have burning a hole in your bank account. There is the Multistrada V2S, the V4S, and Rally Trim for the Adventure Boys. Both bikes feature the same comfortable upright seating position and windscreen. The V2 makes 113 horsepower and 71 foot-pounds of torque, where the V4 makes 170 horsepower and 92 foot-pounds of torque. Both bikes are going to have tech features like ride modes and ABS, but the Multistrada V4S comes with the travel and radar package which includes hard panniers, adaptive cruise control, and blind spot detection. At the end of the day, each bike would happily take you hundreds of miles between your house and the only dealer in your state for service, but the V4 will have more creature comforts if your lifestyle demands it. Now listen, sport touring bikes come in a handful of different styles that will all be slightly biased towards either sporty or touring, but there's plenty of bikes that are pretty close to achieving Swiss Army Knife status of being comfortable, playful, and having having enough luggage space to hold all your belongings after your wife kicked you out of the house for spending all of your time watching Yami Noob videos. You'll just need to determine which side of the sport touring spectrum you'll likely gravitate towards and choose a bike based on that. Thanks for making it all the way to the end. Have you settled into sport touring life or are you still in denial? Be sure to subscribe if you like this type of video and I will catch you later. Fact. Dueling is legal in Paraguay as long as both parties are registered blood and organ donors. So Yu-Gi-Oh fans, head over to Paraguay. Goodbye. Keep, Keep watching. watching.